This is Vern Benham Grimsley on campus. The things that Jesus saw that needed changing were the individual lives of human beings, I believe, and he was setting about changing individual people. You can't seek to change individual people from an outside source. They change themselves from the inside source, which is their own mind. But didn't Jesus say the kingdom of God is within you? I grant you this, but he also assumed that that kingdom would arrive at his death, and all of his gearing was towards the idea that this world was going to take place, that he envisioned at his death or in that period of time. This was an interpretation, I believe, which the apostles of Jesus made, and that was their expectation, but it is not that clearly evidenced in Jesus' own teachings. I think you may find it uh, basically as an impression within the four Gospels. Christ cried aloud, Father, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Assuming that the effect in his mind was due to an outside source, not realizing it was only a schizophrenic effect in his own mind. Well, how do you explain this? The subconscious mind, with the knowledge that Christ now could not do anything about this reality either, massively covered his senses so he could bear the pain of it, and that was the end of it. How do you explain the fact that, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is in fact the first line of the 22nd Psalm, that Jesus was quoting the Old Testament there, and that Psalm ends on a very victorious note of man's relationship to God. I do not think Jesus really felt that, personally, God had abandoned him at that point. So this is a world of coincidence, and coincidence within it needs no explanation. Yeah. It is a coincidence you walk down the street and meet a thousand people you know, but it's only a world of coincidence, and minds that lose sight of the fact that it is a coincidental universe are prone to have to rationalize imponderable coincidences. Would you say that religion is psychologically schizophrenic when, for example, Jung, the psychiatrist, said that he'd never known anyone over the age of 35 to recover psychologically who had not regained a basically religious outlook toward life. And secondly, Alfred Adler, who studied in the early part of the 20th century with Freud in Vienna, said that the ultimate cure for man's neurosis, juvenile delinquency, and so forth would be the learning of neighborly love, which is essentially what Jesus was proclaiming 2,000 years ago. Well, I intend to write a book to set Young completely straight because I've lived through a, a range of these experiences that are fantastic. In other words, in seeking to do something with the effect, a man turns to what the content of his mind has. I would say one of the contents of man's mind is a spiritual fragment, a fragment of infinity, part of God. What do you think about the ideal of this planet living as a family, all people being children of God, all people being brothers in one family? Uh, you know, what should I think? I mean, you know, uh... <laughs> what do you think? Sounds all right to me, man. Sounds all right to you? Uh, <coughs> whereas, whereas Jesus is referred to as the Son of God in the Gospel according to St. Matthew, he refers to himself as the Son of Man, but to me seems to negate the idea of a uh, supernatural being. Uh, would you comment on that? I think that Jesus was both the Son of God and the Son of Man. That Jesus was God incarnate, but that Jesus also was a human being in the sense that he hungered, he thirsted, he felt pain, he grew weary, and all the rest of this. And that Jesus' message was that God is the Father of all men, and that all men are sons and daughters of God in the spiritual sense, and all men are brothers in one family. That this was the essence of his message. But to deny the humanity of Jesus, as some people have done, saying that he was nothing but God wrapped in flesh and not a real human being too, I think is to deny what Jesus himself said about himself in calling himself the Son of Man. In this way, a person can identify with Jesus in a new way, seeing the heroism, the valor of his struggle, of his life, the way he lived, the way he sought the Father's will, the way he lived in this high way. Yes, I agree. I, I think the phrase of the Son of Man has a much uh, more grabbing effect uh, towards people than the, the supernatural approach, you know, which a lot of people, of course, yeah, uh, subscribe to. It makes you feel better. It makes you feel better to pray? makes the person feel better, but I don't think there's any contact with God or anything like that. It, it's, you know, it's, there's no basis for it. Unless you really uh, admit something about yourself that you wouldn't admit any other time, it's kind of a, a security thing, you know. In which case you would gain a new insight into yourself. In if you were honest when you prayed, but if you, it was just the same old jibe, then, it, you know, it wouldn't be anything. It, it, wasn't, it wouldn't be worth anything. It seems to me the only realistic way to pray would be to pray honestly. If a person believes that God is infinite, omniscient, all-knowing, then the attempt to conceal anything from God in one's personal life would be absurd. Yeah, but a lot of people conceal things when they don't, e they don't even know. See, a lot of people are so trained from when they were little ch children that um, they don't even know when they're concealing things, even from themselves. 
because they've been so used to denying themselves stuff that they uh, they they can't they can't help it. What Jesus taught, I think, was not self-denial but self-mastery, the ability to take one's own life in hand and to be a new kind of person from the inside out. All right, I know, I know. Yeah. Okay, yeah. if that. I, I can't argue with you. What what a lot of people around here preach is self denial, yeah. and I and I wouldn't go along with any of that kind of stuff. But you know, I think what Jesus taught was self affirmation, really affirmation of the self as a son of God. That's to have a very high viewpoint of oneself and to see other people that way. If you only love your neighbor as yourself, then you first have to love yourself or have that kind of self respect. I think that's all vague, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's vague to have that kind of respect for yourself. No, it's vague to know when you have that kind of respect for yourself. You can't. You can't tell. It's hard to keep a a, a a a a grip on yourself, so that you know when you're when you're just tripping on other people, ego tripping on other people, and when you're um and when you're um and when you're when you're just you're putting yourself in the same position as your friend. I don't know. I think that's kind of unrealistic. Unrealistic living as a son of God and thinking of oneself that way. Do you think? Yeah. I think it's very realistic. I think that's what the world needs. If people began to live this way, and well, in terms of needs, it might it might solve. If everybody believed in Jesus, it might solve a lot of problems. But not everybody's going to believe in Jesus. You know, I'm saying what I'm saying is, I think it would be a false premise to say. You know, it would it would be the wrong thing to believe in if everybody believed in it. But it would solve a lot of problems. It'd be a lot of jive. I mean, it's like the same thing as they did it a long time ago. Everybody believed in a in a um, a god and they were under the threat of death that they didn't do it and things probably moved along pretty smoothly but it's but it's under that kind of system you have organization and people are working together but but the inside self is not free well jesus said that truth does make a person free on his inside self that a person inwardly can discover his own meaning in life and that it is liberation to live as a son of god well it depends on how you interpret it i see I see a lot of people believe. See, I don't think that everybody can believe in Jesus. Do you believe there is a God then? Oh, yes, I definitely do. <laughs> Does that make a difference in your life? Um, no, I've sort of blown it and decided to take the opposite direction. The opposite direction? Yeah, I kind of just, I don't want to do is what he requires, you know. Like he requires for everlasting life, all kinds of things, you know. And, and it's not hard, but most people want the other kind of life because they're, they like tempting things, you know. You feel that you've made a decision against God's will and purpose? Oh, <laughs> well, it seems sort of like that. At least I'm not doing what he wants right now. You could change, though, couldn't you? Oh, yeah. Do you think you will? I don't know. <laughs> I hope you will. I think it's the biggest decision any person ever faces. I have faced it myself. And the most exhilarating moment of my life was that moment of supreme decision and saying, Father, I really want to do your purposes. It made me joyful. Well, like, well, like, what was your supreme? What was your feeling when you when you finally, you know, hit it? You know. When I found God, you yeah. mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A very. Did you see him? Did you see him? Or or did you did you see the golden gates and all that stuff? Did you see heaven and the, you know through the clouds? No, I didn't see anything with my physical eyes, but it was a joyous feeling. You felt it in your body. I felt it, I'd say, in my soul, which is a strange thing to say. I felt it spiritually. It wasn't just a glandular or emotional feeling, the finding of God. Well, what's it like? I mean, like, like I believe in God, you know. I, like, I pray. I say prayers every night, you know. And, and I'll go that far. I see you, for example. I would call you, if I were going to call you something, I'd call you a daughter of God. You know? Well, what I don't understand is um, I've looked at it a lot of different ways. Like, I've looked at it as a crutch. You know? Religion as a crutch? Yeah. And uh, I've looked at it a lot of times, you know. I, I do a lot of thinking about it when I'm alone. For some people, religion is a crutch. For those who are limping along and who are very weak, but it can also be a pogo stick. I mean, a person yeah. can really yeah. find power in it, you know. And, like, I had a drug problem. Uh, and uh, You were taking, what, LSD? I, I was taking everything. I, I did speed for two years. I, I've done smack. Uh, I, I was in a mental hospital for acid. Um, I'm a... You know, like I'm just a typical drug addict, and you know. Like, are you still on it all, or are you? Yeah, yeah, and like it, I might, like my head is so messed up that uh, that I can't think straight anymore. You know, like I have a lot of feelings that I can't express. Well, I I said one time I'm not going to do the hype anymore. You know, and, and you're not going to shoot heroin or what speed uh, or. What? Yeah, I said I wasn't going to do it anymore, and that was in tenth grade. Yeah. And, and I just did up some coke a couple days ago, you know, like it hasn't worked. I have like, a, um, I got into a religious trip a couple years ago, like in eighth grade, 
and, and I really dug it, like, and I've read the Bible and I've gone through the whole bit, you know? The crucial thing is to make a complete commitment of your life to God and say, Father, here I am, as a daughter of yours, I give my life totally to you and open yourself entirely to God's will and spirit. That's a very difficult decision, but it's a beautiful decision. You see what I mean? The two great commandments in Mark chapter 12 were, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when this new love begins to dominate your life, there's a joy in it then. And then you'll be certain about it, and you'll have power over drugs and over anything that binds you. Well, how, how would I get this feeling? What would I do to do? What would I do? You have to have the faith to believe it. In the same way, I could hold out a handful of diamonds to you, but the choice would still be yours to accept them. That's the choice. It's the choice to accept the love and forgiveness of God. And if you'll only accept it, you see, then you can know the joy of living as a daughter of God. And it's a thrill. Oh, I understand now. Just accept it. Well, remember that God is a father, that he's infinitely loving, and you're infinitely valuable, that God knows every hair on your head, and every thought in your mind, every cavity in your teeth, and he loves you, right? I mean, his mercy endures forever. That's how loving God is, and if you can just dare to believe that and live that way by faith every day and accept this infinite love of God, there's new power in that. There really is. Yeah, okay, I can, all right, I understand that. Well, I can do that, all right, I'll do that. And then go out and begin to live in this new way. Live by that faith, act on that faith, and life is a joy. Yeah, yeah you talked me into it. I'm going to go upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. <laughs> what do you think of that? Yeah, that's beautiful, man. That is beautiful, isn't it? You've been listening to On Campus, a non-sectarian, non-denominational public affairs presentation. For free printed transcripts, write to Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701, and ask for the booklet Questions University Students Ask. It deals with such issues as science versus religion, how might a person define God, and to what extent is religion relevant in a scientific technological age. The title of that free booklet, once again, Questions University Students Ask. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California, 94701. I've also written Finding God, Getting to Know God, and Growing Spiritually. About the processes of inward discovery, the new power and purposeful resource inherent in living by faith. And another free piece of literature is Freedom from Fear. The mailing address, Box 347, Berkeley, California. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international network of stations, let me spell out that mailing address once again. Box 347, Berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 94701, USA. When you write, please send us the call letters of the radio station over which you heard this international broadcast. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley, reminding you to tune in again next time over this same station for On Campus. And may God's will be done by you. Good day. <laughs>